Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of the new GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I am Carrie Otterburn of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Today, we are joined by Professor Michael Zorn to discuss his book, A Theory of Global Governance, Authority, Legitimacy, and Contestation, published in 2018 by Oxford University Press, and which has already become one of the most important theoretical contributions to the field of global governance, and which I'm sure many of the members of our audience today keep near at hand. Michael Zorn is director of the Global Governance Unit at the Berlin Social Science Center, WZB, and professor of international relations at the Free University of Berlin since 2004. He was also the founding dean of the Hurdy School of Governance in Berlin, and he is a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and the Academy of Europe. He is author of numerous monographs and anthologies and has published widely on globalization, global governance, international institutions, and problems relating to the rule of law. Professor Zern is also a Globe Project partner. Also joining us today as discussant is Dr. Kolya Rava. Dr. Rava is Assistant Professor for the European Studies at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Leuven, where he is Program Coordinator at KU Leuven's Master of European Studies. He is also Adjunct Professor at the Brussels Campus of American University. Dr. Rava has published widely on the European Parliament, interparliamentary cooperation, in the European Union and global governance, as well as security policies, the rule of law, legitimacy, and coherence in EU external action. Most recently, he co-edited a volume on the parliamentary cooperation and diplomacy in EU external relations. At the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, he is also co-coordinating co -coordinating the John Monet Network EU Cross, which looks at the European Union at the crossroads of global order. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Professor Zorn of about 25 minutes. Dr. Rabba will then start off the discussion by offering his reflections and asking a few questions, and Professor Zorn will have an opportunity to respond. Then we'll turn to questions from the audience, which may be directed toward either Professor Zorn or Dr. Rabba. Feel free to send questions to me throughout the webinar by using the webinar chat box function on the side of the webinar window. I will collect your questions to share with the speakers following the presentations. Before we begin, just a few words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance, with a specific attention to four key areas, trade and development, security and migration, climate change, and global finance. The three and a half year project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world, as well as to look ahead to 2030 and 2050 in order to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. On behalf of the GLOBE project, I would like to thank both Professor Zorn and Dr. Rabba for joining us today. And now, it's my great pleasure to give the floor to Professor Zorn. Thank you very much for... You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind presentation, uh, for the kind introduction. I'm. Uh, trying now to summarize some of the basic thoughts of the book in 25 minutes, and I hope this will work. And I will do it by essentially presenting this work via a certain focus. Uh, and the focus is a, is a given puzzle uh, that any work about uh, global governance in our days has to give some sort of a response to. While the theory of global governance is broader, is speaking to a number of different issues, is developing concepts, and is also responding to a set of different questions. Uh, I focus now on one thing, and that is a puzzle. And the puzzle is, why is this global governance system that probably emerged in its uh, complete uh, stage in the 1990s, why is it so much under pressure? Why is it so much contested? Currently, and just to illustrate uh, this puzzle, let's look at those friendly men here. Um, they are all, in one or the other way, quite influential in creating the global governance system system that emerged at the latest, as I said, in the 1990s. Uh, they produced a global governance system, which, if we look on the really very aggregate global level, has produced some results which at least do not look very bad. Uh, I mean, look only exemplary at those three uh, numbers on the one end, 
uh, on the left top, we have the development of the uh, global human development index, and it is an enormous rise uh, within uh, 25 years, so far unprecedented in history since we measure the human development index. Very, very successful in that respect. Even with respect to equality on the global scale, as for example, the work of Milanovic has shown, and we have a decline of inequality. Uh, the distribution of wealth across the globe is more even than 25 years ago, in spite of the fact that inequality within some nations has grown. And also, if you look finally at the annual battle deaths uh, in world society, it is also uh, historically seen an uh, all-time low that we have since the 1990s. Again, uh, if you look at those aggregate numbers, the global governance system that emerged in the 1990s by those friendly phases that we just saw has been relatively successful, at least if you look at those numbers. But if you look now to the phases uh, that uh, dominate the political scene right now, uh, they first of all look less friendly, but more importantly, they have one commonality. They challenge international institutions. They challenge the global governance system. They want to leave uh, climate agreements. They want to leave uh, the European integration uh, process. Uh, they are in general very critical of anything uh, that interferes into what they call national sovereignty. So uh, we see with those kind of phases that the global governance system is very much under pressure. Uh, and here, uh, the question, of course, is why? Why did this happen? Why is a system that has produced at least reasonable results uh, now uh, so much challenged by so many different actors? And that's essentially the focus uh, of my presentation in order to introduce the theory of global governance more generally. And what I want to provide with the theory of global governance is an indigenous it is not something that just happened, financial crisis or uh, the rise of new powers, not something that happened externally and then pushed on the system and changed it. The argument is it is deficits of the architecture of the institutional structure of the global governance system that emerged in the 1990s. So it is the global governance system that has produced itself these challenges. And this also points to a, I would label it false dichotomy in our discipline. There is a certain tendency always when we see a war, when we see a conflict, we talk, well, uh, people say, well, you see, this supports the realist view which focuses on conflicts. And all the time when we see a corporation is going on or an institution is set up, people say, well, you see, here support for the ideational, for the idealist or the institutionalist view of world politics. I think this is a, a, a somewhat wrong uh, bifurcation of things because what we see here that it is the level, the amount of international institutions, the strength of international institutions that have developed in the 1990s that have produced conflicts. So it is institutions because those institutions are strong that are to a significant re uh, respect responsible uh, for the crisis of global governance that we currently see. But of course, the major question here is at first, what is the global governance system? Because I'm not only talking about global governance, I'm talking about a global governance system. Uh, any uh, and nevertheless, let me just give this little quote uh, about what is global governance in the first place. And here the argument is global governance refers to the exercise of authority across national borders, as well as consented norms and rules beyond the nation state. Both of them justified the preference for common goods or transnational problems. And you see here it had three components. On the one hand, uh, it refers to either international transnational norms that guide behavior 
or to bodies that make decisions. Uh, that those norms in decisions apply to issues that have transnational features that cross beyond national borders. And thirdly, that those, those norms and policies uh, formulated by the bodies are justified with reference to global goals, to global norms, to global common goods, if you may. So these are the three components of what global governance is. And the argument, the provision of global governance from the 1990s on, from the 1990s on is the result of the rise of a global governance system. And the global governance system consists of three components. One is underlying principles, underlying normative principles, if you may, if you will. Uh, then it is secondly a set of authoritative institutions uh, that essentially make decisions, make interpretations, make policies with preference to the underlying normative principles. And thirdly, it is the interplay of those institutions. Let me run through those three components briefly. What are the underlying principles? I'm saying it is essentially three things. First of all, it is the conviction that there are some global common goods, that there are some things beyond national interest, that there are some things which are in the interest of humankind. And this is peace, this is to some extent human rights, this is a proper uh, uh, climate, a proper ecology uh, that is also uh, the non-proliferation of, 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 of weapons of mass destruction. So there are some general principles which can be described as common goals, as common goods. They, the goods and the, and the goals apply then to the global, not to nations. And because, and that is the second underlying principle, because there are some common goods, there is also a justification for the establishment of international authorities that serve those companies. That is the second component. I talk about uh, this one a little bit more in detail a little bit later. And, 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 and third, the third underlying principle is uh, this uh, global community consists of states and society. So it's not anymore only an interstate society. If people put forward justifications, they need also to speak to the people, they need to speak to societies, to different national societies, to different transnational sectoral societies, maybe also sometimes to the world society as well. So these are the three underlying principles that are essentially uh, the material from which justifications can be built on. The second level is the institutions. And institutions, we all know them, are the United Nations, the World Trade Organizations, and many, many others. Uh, they can be international, intergovernmental, as the ones that I mentioned, but they can be also transnational, like for example, rating agencies and many others. There are thousands of them. Uh, the decisive point about those institutions is that many of those, especially from the 1990s on, it started already earlier, but especially from the 1990s on, displayed some level of authority. They had some authority. They, there was the recognition that those institutions can make decisions and interpretations, which come at least with the ambition to be binding to members of this world society. Authority is a very decisive element here. Authority says in the first place, it is the recognition that some actors are willing to follow those international institutions. Uh, in that sense, it is a form of power. You do something because someone else tells you to do uh, this and decisive is not the quality of the argument. Decisive is not whether it is incentivized or whether it comes with coercion. Decisive is that you follow it because it has been stated by this authority. You accept the authority as someone who is uh, uh, willing and able uh, 
uh, to formulate some guidelines for you. And that is, of course, a sort of a social paradox. Uh, uh, Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu has labeled it uh, the, the complicity uh, of the subdue. Uh, Marx Horkheimer has uh, labeled uh, it the paradox of obedience. So, I mean, people follow uh, something because, or people uh, voluntarily accept a subordination under uh, an, an authority. Uh, and, and that is for the social in general a paradox, but power, but clearly a paradox that we can observe very, very often. I personally uh, believe in climate change, but I have never tested it. I'm not really able to check the argument by looking at the models. I believe it because the majority of scientists argue that it is the case and that they bring forward uh, some, some plausible models. So I have, I believe in the authority of those uh, scientists. Uh, I have never tested whether the world is flat or round, but I, but I believe that it is round because science tells me that it is round. So in that sense, this paradox of authority is existent in, in all elements of social life, but it becomes a super paradox when it comes to international authority. Because international authorities are small IOs with small secretariats, and uh, those who, who are subordinated to those international authorities are often states, very powerful states with enormous apparatus, uh, with, with, with enormous resources uh, at, their, uh, at their hand. In that sense, it is a super paradox, and that leads to a very specific part. Authority. When we talk about international authority, it is a relatively weak form of authority. It is a reflexive form of authority that is dominant in global governance. We are not talking about commands. The WTO has never commanded uh, the US to do something. They formally requests, and the requests are then checked by the nation states for their plausibility. And in a sense, there is always some sort of exit option. Secondly, there is the permanent attempt to contest those authorities. That's somewhat different than looking to traditional authority like churches and so on. They were contested at a certain point in history, but for a long time, they existed relatively uncontested. IOs are permanently contested whether they do the right thing and stuff like that. And uh, thirdly, I mean, I, with my examples, I already uh, hinted to it. There's a difference between, let's say, classical political authorities like the United Nations who make decisions and expect that those decisions are, decisions are followed, and more epistemic authorities than, let's say, dispute settlement bodies who essentially make interpretations of facts and then expect that those interpretation of facts are, are, are leading to a change of, of behavior. So the whole point here is, International institutions that can make decisions or interpretations that come with a certain ambition of, of uh, being followed by, of being, uh, of, of creating obligations, they have grown in, in importance. Uh, those institutions have, in a sense, undermined the consensus principle of international politics that states have to do only this thing that they have agreed to do. This is different with the rise of international authoritative institutions because some of those institutions ask some states to do things that they obviously do not want to do. And I mean, I won't explain this now in detail, but let me just show you this uh, graph here, uh, which measures the authority of international organizations. Again, are there any procedures that allow uh, the making of decisions or interpretations that can be done without the consent of all participating states. If we have those procedures, then we talk about authority that can happen via majority decisions, that can also happen via delegation to certain bodies to make that decision. And we see that IOs uh, have developed in a way that we can talk about a rise of international authority uh, over time. And that means clearly that uh, there is 
and global governance going on, which has an element of being coercive, of being authoritative. Uh, global governance institutions may intervene with violent means to protect human rights. They have done it in the 1990s. The United Nations have done it in, has done it in the 1990s. Uh, international institutions may impose austerity policies on countries, which certainly, with countries that certainly did not agree uh, to those austerity policies. Take just Greece as an example. The national institutions may prohibit it. National policies, policies in order to protect national industry, all the stuff that the WTO did. I can go on with those kind of examples, but I don't have to do it in order to argue. Global governance is going on, and global governance is going on within a global governance system because those institutions that I talk about, and that's the third level now, also interact with each other. And the global governance system has two central features, and it comes to the interaction of different international institutions. The first is, it is essentially each issue area which has its separate international institution. There's a very weak link between different institutions. While in the national political system, there's a certain architecture, a, a fixed architecture between different international institutions in the international realm, the WTO and the Climate Organization and the United Nations Security Council are only loosely coupled with each other. They exist in separate issue areas uh, and, and in that sense there is not a final place in which the decisions are made. Secondly, we have an extremely weakly established separation of while the logic of an international organization, of an assembly, an executive body, and even sometimes courts, uh, pretends to have this uh, separation of power in practice, it is always a combination of the secretariat with the executives of the major powers, which essentially control each branch of governance. Take again the United, the United Nations Security Council and uh, interventions into into uh, violent conflicts as an example it is it is the major powers uh, in the in the uh, uh, g5 meeting who have decided uh, at a certain point that it is not only in the state wars but also uh, wars within uh, civil wars within societies that are a reason for the united nations security council to become active it is the same uh, powers that essentially implement those policy and apply it to a certain case by saying, now, Libya, you have violated these principles. Uh, and then it's still the same powers who send uh, the military to enforce uh, those rules. And all this takes place in the case of the United Nations Security Council without a court that controls those procedures. In that sense, the whole, uh, uh, idea of a separation of power is very, very weakly uh, established. That's the second feature if we come to the third component of the global governance system, the interaction uh, of different institutions. Let me just summarize the three layers of the global governance system that I talked about. We have the underlying normative principles uh, that I talked about, uh, a rudimentary notion of the global common good, the acceptance of the principal possibility of international authority uh, and uh, then also the idea that those authorities are accountable to both states and societies. We have then an enormous amount of specific institutions, international ones and transnational ones. Uh, they all exercise to some extent authority in different issue areas. And then on the third level, we have interaction between authorities and those expose two fundamental legitimation problems on the one hand, the spheres of authority are only loosely coupled, so there is no final side of authority, the meta authority on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have a very weak separation of power. Uh, and that is something that leads, so the argument goes on to legitimation problems of the global governance system. Uh, in any case, the global governance 
system exercises political authority, and that means it must be legitimated. And the whole notion of legitimation is, in a sense, dependent on the notion of political authority. If you have political authority, if you exercise rule, then you must legitimate. And with the rise of the global governance system, there is an increased need for legitimation. And Max Weber has put it very nicely, the rise of authority is normally accompanied by the permanent attempt to arouse and nurse the beliefs in legitimacy. And the thesis is now that the global governance system is very, very bad in uh, uh, arousing and nursing the beliefs in legitimacy. They attempt it, they try to do it, uh, they try to legitimate it, but they are not very successful. And uh, the reason essentially why they are not very successful is because they fail to provide the basic ingredients of successful legitimation. And the basic ingredients of successful legitimation uh, is essentially creating the impression that the authority exercises or is exercised in an impartial way and it can be justified with a narrative that refers to a common purpose, to common goals, and has the right procedures to do so. And the global governance system uh, uh, fails to do this because on the one hand, we don't have sufficient narratives. The loosely coupled spheres of authority lead to a situation where we have no political space, where uh, public debates broad public debates are possible. There are, of course, transnational debates, but they are sectoral. There is no place where the final decision is made. We know this meta-authority place in national political system. It's the head of government. Uh, it is the Supreme Court. It's parliaments. It's, it's the public. All those sites of meta-authority of the national political system are very, very weakly developed only in the global governance system. There are elements of it. You can see maybe the G20 meeting as a side of such a meta authority. At certain times, maybe it was the American president. At certain times, it was maybe the United Nations Security Council, but always only in a very, very rudimentary form, not a, a permanently institutionalized place of a final meta authority, which is the place of the big public debates, which is the place where you can have the debate between freedom and security, between growth and uh, environmental protection. Those kind of debates are not possible in a sectoralized global governance system, and the current global governance is sectoralized. And therefore, the only thing that is available in terms of legitimation mechanism, in terms of legitimation narrative, is a technocratic legitimation. A technocratic legitimation works to some extent, but it is overburdened when it comes to austerity policies. It is overburdened when it comes to military interventions. Moreover, and more fundamentally, the weak separation of power leads to a lack of impartiality. When I say lack of impartiality, I do not mean that the norms as such are impartial. And norms always have distributive consequences, but it is absolutely fundamental for the legitimacy of any authority, of any system of rule, that there is the appearance that the rules are exercised impartially. Uh, when the most fundamental basic principle that alike cases should be treated alike is violated, then you see an enormous decline of legitimation. That is true for all kinds of systems of authority. Impartiality, like cases should be treated alike, is a fundamental condition for legitimacy and it is violated very, very often in the global governance system because it is the national executives of the most powerful states who control those uh, institutions and who essentially need to employ resources if they want to have a certain decision implemented. That leads, of course, to the kind of uh, cases where the possession of nuclear capacities uh, is judged differently. For example, in the, in the Near East, it leads also to a situation that 
if France and Germany in the EU do have uh, fundamental problems with their budget, it ends up with a nice letter if Greece and Portugal do have fundamental problems that leads to austerity policies. So there's a lack of impartiality and that leads to uh, legitimation problems. Let's look whether if I'm at least at face value right by saying the current, if we, if we look to those contestations, contestations, if you think about the friendly phases or the unfriendly phases that I, that I showed to you in the beginning, we have the authoritarian potentates like Putin, Erdogan, Modi and Orban. We have, especially in Western Europe, offering authoritarian populist groups in consolidated democracies that challenge international institutions very strongly, Le Pen, Farage, AfD, and many others. We have, of course, fundamentalist religious movements that are very critical of global governance. We have some of the so-called rising powers that are critical of, uh, of global governance. And we have, of course, the transnational protest movements, which, is, which we essentially argue that it is too neoliberal, this whole global governance system. If we say these are the most fundamental um, contestants of the current global governance system, then you can see that all of those groups refer to at least one of the two legitimation deficits of the global governance system. Authoritarian potentates criticize mostly the double standards and uh, demand national sovereignty. This national sovereignty is in their view decisive and there's probably no statement uh, 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 like Putin who uses the term double standard as often as he does. There are many authoritarian populist groups in consolidated democracies that turn against those as they label it distant, outspoken, uh, distant and detached liberal cosmopolitans uh, who are in charge. Uh, so it is again a criticism. There are those technocratic guys who dominate the world in order uh, that they get rich and the, uh, and the people on the street uh, do not get rich. And the fundamentalist religious movements see themselves as the spearhead, uh, uh, see international institutions as the spearhead of Western imperialism. So it's also directed against the Western dominance. Rising powers seek international institutions that are somewhat different uh, and that give them reasonable participation rights. They criticize the Western dominance of international institutions and transnational NGOs are committed especially to the democratization of international institutions in order uh, to prevent the bias for those cosmopolitan elites that they contain. In that sense, all of those contestants refer to the fundamental legitimation uh, problems of the global governance system when they criticize uh, international uh, institutions. Uh, let me let me end here and by, by saying this is of course not the whole story. Also the book goes on by arguing then the final outcome depends to a significant extent uh, on the responses by those uh, authority holders and defenders of international authority. But that's something maybe that we can deepen uh, in the discussion, and I'm sure Korea will also uh, point uh, to this to this issue. My time has been used by a presentation which got a little bit longer than expected, but I hope there's still sufficient time for a discussion for you, Korea, and then for Q and A later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zorn, for this engaging presentation. I would like to now give the floor to uh, Dr. Rauba to kick off today's discussion. But before I do, I would like to remind the audience that the Q&A will begin soon. And you can send me your questions by using the chat box on the side of the webinar window. Um, so please send those to me through, um, through that feature and we can answer them in the Q&A session. All right, and I'm just bringing Dr. Rauba back online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Zürn, for this very interesting presentation, for the uh, most interesting book um, that you have been writing and put forward. I think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, um, uh, contribution to the debate about global governance, its authority, uh, legitimacy, and as, you, as, you, as it says in the title, contestation. Um, 
in fact, uh, you know, uh, when you uh, when you follow your uh, contribution to the field, it is uh, also a wonderful, uh, if you like, um, presentation of uh, the thoughts that you have been bringing into the debate um, over uh, the last years. And uh, in that sense, uh, I would like to congratulate you to to this book. Um, the presentation which you which you've given is very clear, and I I, I think it is very um, stimulating. And I would like to basically uh, follow up on a couple of comments. Perhaps it's rather um, you know questions which you have already answered in your talk, but which may actually be uh, interesting to to once more uh, hear you reflecting about um, in our discussion. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that, uh, in fact, uh, we are facing uh, or have always been facing in the global governance system um, a so-called super paradox of global governance system authority uh, in the sense that we tend to uh, go complicit uh, and uh, even obey, so to speak, to things that we cannot uh, check, which we sim simply have to believe and that are, uh, if you like, um, brought uh, about because of the system and how the system uh, performs authority. Now, I, I think this is a very important point. Um, when we think, however, about what goes on, and I will come to legitimacy and authority a little bit later again, um, one is wondering what are currently the, let's call it the counter forces um, that the global governance system is facing and is perhaps one of the overarching strategy of these so-called uh, contesters, contestants of uh, the global governance um, system to actually uh, go beyond the complicity, to actually make uh, people realize various constituents around the world in domestic settings, in regional settings, in a transnational fashion to not go complicit, to actually question what was for a long time, if you like, um, a permissive consensus of uh, the global governance system. Uh, so that is just a reflection upon this super paradox and uh, trying to understand what are the current forces at stake. I would like to come also back to one uh, issue that you have been mentioning and that is very present in your book, the question of legitimacy and legitimization of the global governance system. Um, in my in my own words, uh, uh, and um, I would I would have uh, always um, said, and I think it's also to a certain degree in your book that the global governance system is very good at delivering what people also in the context of the European Union have called output legitimacy. In fact, it needs output legitimacy to a certain extent. Um, but what happens, um, and perhaps we can we can use the terminology uh, a little bit. Um, uh, just to make it um, a bit a bit more uh, visual. At the same time, the, the, the global governance system and actually uh, systems of multi-level governance have always been difficult, ha had always had difficulties to bring in input and what has been termed throughput legitimacy. And you alluded to this, right? The, um, the system has problems in terms of separation of powers. The system has problems to actually show impartiality or also to show that everybody is actually benefiting uh, from the system and has contributed to the system at the same time. So what happens if that system is losing output legitimacy? And I think what we currently see is that through contestation, um, a lot of forces are actually bringing um, together a situation which has been called by, 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 by others a gridlock of the global governance system. And I think you also allude to this in your book very nicely. So the system is currently in a situation where it cannot produce, where it cannot effectively produce um, solutions to the transnational problems, to the uh, uh, to to work on the common goods, which 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 were actually um, legitimizing its authority in the first place. So what happens in such a case? How can actually the global governance system respond? And I think it would be interesting to hear your reflection a little bit more on this, um, whether it is a system that responds, can a system uh, respond 
systematically or would we have to think about different con constituents that would take the lead and 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 bring perhaps the global governance system even in a direction of less impartiality um, can a global governance system in such a situation actually still provide uh, a narrative of impartiality or would it have to choose also strategically have to choose um, uh, a new direction and it brings me uh, perhaps to my third point and uh, I, I, I will be very quick on this uh, that is of course linked to uh, the underlying normative or normativity of the system which people have very often called a liberal western um, normativity which is being uh, tested uh, from within uh, from uh, less liberal forces but also from the outside by going against the um, uh, system or actually setting up new systems new institutions which are trying to serve as alternatives now the question is a little bit can we think of a mutuality can we think of a new uh, fragmented um, global governance system which is less uh, perhaps uh, deemed to actually work into the same direction uh, but which is much more built on the idea of uh, let's say ongoing competition uh, of kinds especially in special uh, sectors of the global governance system you you mentioned uh, the financial sector but i think uh, we can we can think of many different um, uh, areas of uh, global governance where perhaps in this context um, different uh, normativities would underlie uh, the uh, different features of the system and the question is i think to a large extent um, is that what uh, is also in one of your new projects? Is that what we may call a post-liberal script? Or would we assume, let's say, the old so-called liberal order to push and try to push the global governance system rather into um, a direction which uh, would more speak for continuation and continuity? Thank you very much again for your most interesting presentation. Well, uh, thank you very much. I mean, this is uh, really very, very interesting comments right on target and clearly pointing to some of the uh, open issues and, and also to some issues to some extent that have developed very, very recently. I mean, the, the first one, do we see increasingly actors that challenge uh, the whole idea of the possibility of international authority uh, and is essentially the super paradox turning against itself, um, I would say clearly we do. And then I, I would, for example, argue, I mean, I stopped the, I, I skipped the large part of the presentation and one element of, the, of this final part speaks to this issue. If you take, for example, at least some of the rhetoric of the current administration of Donald Trump, then it is such a strong and clear-cut focus on national interest that it in a sense denies the possibility of some global common goods. Uh, I mean, if you just take uh, his forward to the national security strategy that he has laid out uh, later in 2018, you see, you see essentially a strategic vision, and I'm quoting now his words, uh, which is therefore protecting the American people and preserving our way of life, uh, uh, promoting our prosperity, preserving peace through American strength and advancing American influence in the world. I mean, if you see this sort of goal, that is essentially putting forward a notion of the world order in terms of national interests without referring to any global common goods. And if you deny the existence of global common goods, the next step is only logical you deny the need for international authorities and international institutions. And that's what uh, right-wing populists do in general. Uh, I think it's no accident that we have this marriage of these political groupings and those who deny uh, climate change. Because if you systematically uh, reject international institutions, you need to reject the idea that there are 
common problems, that there are global problems. Uh, the easiest way is to say, no, they are not there, therefore we don't need it, uh, and we can focus on our, on our national uh, interests. And that is absolutely right. I think this is what happens in the last uh, uh, five or ten years very vividly. There is a challenge of international authority. Uh, the argument is there is a challenge of international authority because uh, these international authorities were very bad in legitimizing themselves. Uh, that leads to the to the legitimacy issue, and and I think you're absolutely right in a sense. The belief in output uh, legitimacy. I think that's the de decisive addition that I want to make. The belief in output legitimacy was the most important part of legitimacy of international institutions. But it is not the output as such. It is the question where people believe that uh, those outputs that they ascribe to international institutions do good for them. And, and here, the major issue is, in a sense, uh, the, the issue of ascription. It's not so much what they do uh, and whether it is good or bad. It, it seems to me very much the, the, the issue of communication. Is there a narrative that brings people to believe that those international institutions do good things for them? Uh, and, and I think here is a basic failure built into it because all the communication structure open up this sort of general a, a game that everything that is good uh, has been done by the national governments, uh, government and that is bad has been done by the EU and the, or international institutions. I mean, it's a game very strictly and rigidly played by populist parties. Um, and, and it is, of course, also the, the fact that where this game has been played for decades in the most intensive way and that are majoritarian parliamentary systems in UK, in the US, there you have the strongest turn against those international institutions because it was always a sort of a political system built on districts, built on local politics and on the local politics side. Uh, these are the enemy, enemies very far away. And in that sense, we are talking about, about inscriptions of, 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 of output. Uh, that creates the catch of the catch 22 that you talked about. Uh, the more there is resistance, the less those IOs can really do, and and the less they can do good, right? So I mean, I absolutely agree. This is a gridlock. This is a catch 22 situation. The question is how to get out of it. Uh, briefly, I think we can distinguish maybe two two different challenges to the current global governance system. One is the rejection of international authority as such. The other is the acceptance of international authority, but of a little bit less liberal, a little bit less intrusive international authority. And that's uh, what we sometimes hear from some of the rising powers. Essentially the argument, yes, I mean, we need some form of cooperation. Uh, this system wasn't a bad. Finally, it helped us to move up in the in the hierarchy. But then now we want to have the same rights. Now we want to have uh, the same rights as the Western states on the one hand. And the moment when we have the same rights, we will reject any possibility of intervening into domestic affairs. So human rights uh, and, 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 and similar things. And I think that's very much the sort of challenge that is provided uh, by the rising powers. It's not the same rejection of international institutions as such as we hear it from authoritarian populists. It's more the uh, rejection of a different of a different sort of international institution and then that's the very intrusive liberal one. Uh, and that's of course, if, if, you, if, you, if you want, this is maybe the chance for uh, a situation where we do not see the decline of global governance, but a change in global governance, a change in global governance in which then the rising powers play a much more important role. But this change, of course, means it is less intrusive, it is less strong, and probably it is, it is less good in terms of output. Thank you very much um, for this, these responses. Uh, we have several questions from the audience, so um, perhaps we can move to those and try to cover a few in our remaining um, 11 minutes. Uh, so first we have a question from Makiko Nishitani. 
I'm asking you to expand a bit on your definition of the deepening of global governance, uh, saying that you defined it as institutionalized changes that target the deficits of the global governance system, but um, do not you do not necessarily expand on which those deficits might be. Um, they could be participation, effectiveness, et cetera. And given the trade-offs, um, is it not the case that conflicts Without effective meta-governance, such complex of opinions could lead to the weakening of institutions. For instance, if you have um, if you have a societal demand for more participation, could that not reduce the effectiveness of the institution? Uh, so that's one. That's the first question. Um, we also have a question from. Um, let's see. We have so many here. So I'm <laughs> trying to sort through. Um, from Charles Roger. I'm asking, um, saying first that you've written a wonderful thought-provoking book, um, but wondering about the claims um, about global governance, but focusing primarily on international organizations, um, particularly with respect to the data set that you employ. And this is a very traditional type of actor, but he says that when he thinks of the term global governance, he typically uses it to refer to a much wider variety of arrangements from public private partnerships to private regulatory bodies to uh, trans governmental networks and so on. Could you discuss how your framework helps us to illuminate these other dimensions of global governance? And do you think that the insights from your book extend um, fairly readily to such cases? And if not, in what ways do you think we have to adapt the approach you develop? We have a couple questions about the role of developing, um, developing economies and rising powers, wondering where they fit in the global governance picture. If if not just for contestation of it, then, then what role do they, they play? And then we have um, some question, another question from Wolfgang Huff. Can regional integration processes like the EU, ASEAN, AU, et cetera, serve as stepping stones toward an enhanced global governance by relativizing the still claimed sovereignty of the nation state in the Westphalian system, notably in the UN? I'll start with those. We have several more, but can we see where that takes us? Sure. Uh, I think it's it's really my turn to the first one. Uh, I I would suggest separating the definition of global governance and global governance system from the legitimacy problem. So I mean we can broadly define global governance in terms of those authorities, those uh, international institutions, and their interplay with each other and the justifications that they use on the one hand. But then on the other hand, the argument is when it comes to the legitimation, they do have systematic problems. Uh, and, and one is this impartiality thing, uh, 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 which leads to a situation that uh, some uh, actors feel discriminated because alike cases are not treated alike. That leads immediately to the sense of discrimination. And that's the most undermining sense. Uh, and secondly, because there is not the, this meta authority place, this is essentially the argument. Therefore, there is no place for real broad participation. Uh, it is, if you look at the at the at national political systems as a as a reference point, uh, before you can have broad participation, you need to have a place where the big political questions are decided where you also have the interaction between different spheres of authority. So uh, even in the national political context, people do not really talk about a lot what kind of environmental instrument is most conducive to reaching a certain goal. That is not what big public debates are about. P big public debates are about goal conflicts, uh, about conflicts between different spheres of authority. They are between, as I mentioned, growth or environmental protection. They are between freedom or security. And those kind of debates can only take place if you have a uniting political space where all the different subsystems feed into. And that is missing on the global level. And therefore, it is so difficult to create procedures that can feed the narrative of participation. That, that is essentially the argument uh, 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 here. Secondly, I think 
not sure if I remember correctly, is absolutely right. Uh, uh, the database is on international governmental organizations and, and global governance consists of both uh, the intergovernmental organizations and the transnational ones. And I would argue that the transnational ones often exercise authority as well. Take the rating agencies as, as an example. Uh, uh, in, in that sense, it is, it is right that this figure uh, refers only to a part of the story I would, however, argue if we look at the transnational ones, uh, the rise of authority would be similar in the 1990s than on the side of the international, uh, of the of the IGO ones, of the intergovernmental ones. The point is that if we talk now, what happens when we have all those contestations? Uh, I think one possibility, one possible outcome is that we see a significant weakening of the intergovernmental ones and maybe a strengthening of the transnational ones, of the hybrid ones, of the more informal ones, of those who fly lower, so to speak, and which are, uh, to use my terminology here, more epistemic and less uh, uh, political. I mean, if I uh, just may show you uh, those two graphs here, uh, one is essentially just distinguishing on the level of intergovernmental organizations still epistemic and political authority and you see that uh, epistemic authority is growing steeper than uh, uh, a political one. Uh, even more so if you look at the database of Oliver Wester window, you see that the decline of authority uh, on the level of transnational public governance initiatives and world politics is very little. Uh, also since 2000 or 2010, it still grows, and in that sense, there may be a possibility that we see a shift of mode of global governance away from the intergovernmental organization to more transnational, public, private, hybrid governance initiatives. Uh, however, I always would argue, yes, we may see this, but this comes at a cost, and the cost is they are less effective. Great. Uh, do we have time for another question? Or are you moving up? I guess we haven't, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I just very briefly take the, this, this, this final one that I noted here. Uh, as, as I said, I think the, the rising economies, they provide a different challenge than white populists. It's not so much directed against global governance as a whole, it's directed at a change of global governance, giving the global South more voice in being less uh, intrusive. And the regional integration, I would see it as a part, as a as a building block uh, of global governance. So they do not contradict global governance. But if we would have only regional integration without any global governance, then we would have a, a systematic deficit uh, uh, on the global level because there is still then the competition uh, 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 competition between different regions. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we actually do not have enough time for another round of questions today. Um, but thank you all for sending in your very interesting questions. And thank you very much, Professor Zern, for your presentation and your responses, and, and, and uh, Dr. Rauba for your uh, compelling discussion points. And before leaving you, I would like to announce uh, some future GLOBE activities. Our GLOBE webinar series will continue next month with two webinars. First, on March 2nd, with Professor Shirzad Shadakoja on his new book, Industrial Policy in the World Trade Organization. And then on March 16th with Professor Lisbeth Huga on her recent book, A Theory of International Organization. And then in April, Professor Stefano Ponta will join us to discuss his new book, Business, Power, and Sustainability in a World of Global Value Chains. So please do check out our website at globe-project.eu for further details and for updates on the GLOBE project. And thank you for joining us today and we hope you will join us again next time. From Professor Zurn, Dr. Rauba, the GLOBE team, and myself, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.